Got my glory jacket on tonight. Every good girl needs a sparkle. But you know what? One of our greatest honors and privileges is to lead this church. We love these churches that are represented in this room. And thank you. Thank you. Church, just tonight as I was standing in worship, and this is not in my notes, but God is here tonight. He is here, and He wants you free. Jesus came that we would have life and life to the full. The Word of God says, He who the Son sets free is free indeed. And tonight, my prayer is that you would walk out of these doors freer than when you came in last night. That you would walk out of this place with a sense of God, you are with me and I leave here with you. Not going back into my circumstance alone, not going back to face my situation, but I am going in freedom. I am going in power and I'm going with the Spirit of God alive inside of me tonight. And I feel like, and this is what I felt in worship, there are some of you here, the enemy is trying to remind you of your past. He is trying to hold you ransom to the things that you once did, the life that you once lived, the sin you once committed. But when Jesus Christ stood on that cross naked, when Jesus Christ stood on that cross stripped, he stood there taking on everything you have ever done, everything you will ever do. And sin has no power over us tonight. The enemy's shame has no power over you tonight. And I refuse to accept that you would walk out of that door filled with shame because Jesus Christ set you free of your shame tonight. And I believe that there are some of you, you need to take hold of that for your life and absolutely refuse to let the enemy hold you back, hold you down, tell you you are not good enough, tell you you cannot be free of your past, that you cannot be free of the things you have done because he who the Son sets free shall be free indeed. Amen, church. And when you, when the enemy tries to remind you, you remind him of who your God is. When he tries to remind you of your sin, you remind him who won at that cross. You remind him who has already won for eternity. And you can walk out of this place tonight free in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for every woman who is sitting here tonight. God, you have a moment to meet with them in a place where there is faith and expectation for the Spirit of God to come. And Holy Spirit, tonight, I invite you to come into this place and sweep over every life in the name of Jesus. I thank you, God, that your presence is here to bring healing, to bring hope, to bring freedom, to bring change, to bring transformation, and to release faith over our lives. And God, tonight, I thank you that every life would rise up and be who you have called them to be, the fullness of your plan. I thank you that no devil in hell will stop the church of Jesus Christ, the woman of the church of Jesus Christ from rising up into who you have called us to be. And I thank you tonight as we exit these doors, we go knowing that we are yours. We go knowing that you are with us and we go in authority and in freedom and in power and in liberty. And tonight, God, I thank you that as I preach, it would not just be good ideas. It would not just be what I think. But Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come tonight. You would anoint my lips to speak your truth in Jesus' name. God, you would anoint every heart and every ear to hear what the Spirit of God is saying us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hasn't this been an incredible day and a half? Aren't you so glad you are here? Isn't God 
so kind. Isn't he so beautiful? So I've got a word, I really, I've been carrying this conference. I feel like I've been pregnant with it for about nine months, carrying this. And I feel like tonight God is wanting to birth something, birth something into this church, birth something into our life, a newness and a freshness and a release of that we simply just believe. Amen. So I'm going to preach a word tonight, which, say, which I've called, and it's not a very good title, but it's really the only thing I could come up with. But what's he asking and what you're facing? And so if I had to ask every one of you in this place tonight a question of how many of you are currently work, walking a journey of faith, your own faith journey? And I feel like 99.9% .9 of us would put up our hands, right? And I believe that we can almost be divided into two types of faith responses that are being required. Maybe you are those who need, need faith to do what God has asked you to do. And then those of you who need faith to face what you are currently facing. And maybe you're someone who falls into both of that. You need faith to respond to him and you need faith to face what you are facing. And so tonight, I want to have a look at the life of Mary. And I'm going to read a portion of scripture to us from Luke. And I want you to just listen, and then we're going to read it. We're going to talk about it. But from Luke 1, verse 26, and this is from the Message Translation. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to the Galilean village of Nazareth to a virgin engaged to be married to a man descended from David. His name was Joseph, and the virgin's name was Mary. Upon entering, Gabriel greeted her. Good morning. You are beautiful with God's beauty, beautiful inside and out. God be with you. She was thoroughly shaken, wondering what was behind a greeting like that. But the angel assured her, Mary, you have nothing to fear. God has a surprise for you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son and call his name Jesus. He will be great, be called the son of the highest. The Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. He will rule Jacob's house forever. No end ever to his kingdom. Mary said to the angel, but how? I've never slept with a man. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will hover over you. Therefore, the child you bring to birth will be called Holy, the Son of God. And did you know that your cousin Elizabeth conceived a son, old as she is? Everyone called her barren, and here she is six months pregnant. Nothing you see is impossible with God. And Mary said, yes, I see it all now. I am the Lord's maid, ready to serve. Let it be with me, just as you say. And the angel left her, blessed among women. Mary didn't waste a minute. She got up and traveled to a town in Judah, in the hill country, straight to Zachariah's house. She greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in her womb left. She was filled with the Holy Spirit and sang out exuberantly. And I'm going to stop there. How many times have you read the account of Mary? And, you know, so often we read it like it's a story. Maybe a story we read to our kids at night before they go to bed. Yes, there was a young girl. She became pregnant by the Holy Spirit with the Son of God. And we, we almost think of it just as a story. We know Jesus. But this encounter that Mary had with the angel, it's, it's so much more than just a story. Number one, an angel appeared to her. Now, that's not a normal occurrence. You know, I did a quick Google search, and an angel appeared about 18 times in the Bible. And in fact, before the New Testament, three or four times an angel had actually appeared. So this was not a normal occurrence. In fact, 
out of the 18 times, an angel had to appear three times to Joseph. It just took him a little bit longer to get with the program that his wife was pregnant by the Holy Spirit with the child of God. So she needed one visit, he needed three, you know, to just get on the same page. But really, it was not a normal occurrence. And so this morning, I want to look at three, four things about this story. And the first is, I want to have a look at Mary's reality. And I know in this room, there are many of us, we have a reality. We walk out this door and go home to our reality. We can have these moments in the presence of God, but we've got to go back into our reality. And the thing I love about these moments is we take these moments into our reality. We don't leave them behind. We bring heaven into our reality. But Mary had a reality. Number one, she was a virgin and she had never slept with a man. You know, I remember when I found out I was pregnant with our fourth child, Lily. Complete surprise. When I say a surprise, a complete surprise. And I remember in that first gynae appointment with my gynecologist, I sat there and I said to him, how did this happen? <laughs> he looked at me and he said, my girl, this is your fourth child. If you don't know that by now, we've got some problems. <laughs> I said, I know how, but how? And so this young girl was pregnant by the Holy Spirit after never, never having been with a man. That was her reality. And her reality I'm going to skip ahead here. Mary didn't know how this happened. Her reality was the supernatural hand of God placing the Son of God in her womb. That was her reality. It was miraculous. It was supernatural. It was not normal. That was her reality. She was a young girl. People put her between the ages of 13 and 15 years old. That was her reality. And the second thing I want to look at is Mary's fear. In Luke 1 verse 30, it says, But the angel reassured her, saying, do not yield to your fear, Mary, for the Lord has found delight in you and has chosen to surprise you with the wonderful gift. And what I want to look at here is Mary's fear was real. Mary's fear was real. You know, we read the story on the other side of what happened. You know, they say hindsight is 20-20 vision. When you're on the other side of something, you think, oh, yeah, like that's what happened. But she was on this side of it, not knowing what the outcome was going to be, not knowing what was going to happen. Her fear was real. The result of Mary's reality, the result of her yes to God could have been death. She could have died. The result of Mary's reality was her fiance Joseph was going to leave her. And then the angel visited him three times. So then we sorted that problem out. But her reality was, I'm either going to die, my fiance is going to leave me, I'm going to be shamed and abandoned. She was living in a different time to we are now. A pregnancy out of marriage was something people died for. And she was fearful. And you know, tonight, many of us, and throughout this entire conference, God has been speaking. And I believe tonight that God is wanting to deliver us from our fears. But the thing about fear is fear is real. And so often what we do, people tell us their fear and we just like, yeah, 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 you'll get over it. But your fear is real to you. 
And we sometimes make the mistake of trying to like poo-poo someone's fear and say, yeah, yeah, it'll be okay. But it's real. And I don't know what your real fear is tonight, but I want you to know, yes, it's real for you. Yes, what you are facing is real. Yes, what you fear you are fearing, you have a real fear. Even if that fear is based on something unfounded, it's real to you. And for Mary, this fear was real to her. But girls, tonight, I am trusting God that the power of fear is broken over your life because you know the God who promised that he would deliver you from my fears. God is not okay and will not leave you in a place of saying, yes, you've got fear. Do you know what? It's okay. You'll always struggle with it. I believe there can be victory over fear. And no matter how real it is in your life right now, God is able to deliver you. The third thing is Mary's response. And you know, so often when we are faced with God telling us, I want you to do this, what's our first response? No, God, I can't. God, what you are asking me to do is actually too much for me. And I know, I've been in those moments, I say, God, I I just, I can't. What you are asking is too hard. What you are asking is too difficult. I think you might have the wrong person. Anyone feel those moments? God, I don't think I can do it. And that's real. An angel from heaven appeared to Mary, telling her she is pregnant with the child of God. And Mary's response after the angel said to her, do not yield to your fear was, yes, I see it now. I am the Lord's maid, ready to serve. Let it be with me, just as you say. There is a power in her response of obedience. Girls, when we, even when it's hard, even when it's scary, even when it's putting us in a place that, God, I don't know if I can do this. When we respond with a yes, God takes us by the hand. He said, well, you're not going to have to do this alone. Mary did not have to do that pregnancy alone. The God of heaven and earth was with her. And girls, tonight, you are not alone. And for some of you, I believe God has. And for some of you, God will. Is going to ask many of you in this room to do some big, bold, brave, and really scary things for him. Does that sound like good news? No one's going, pick me, God, pick me. But there's girls in this room who he has got things to do through your life. And if you don't respond, yes, who else is going to do it? And for some of you, you need to consider, God, what is my response? Her response was, yes, God. And tonight, let our response be yes. And sometimes our response is doing something, and I love a phrase we've all coined that Joyce Meyer said, sometimes you've just got to do things afraid. But do it. Don't allow the enemy to cripple you with fear that you shrink back and you just cannot do it. Rather stand up and say, yes, I'm afraid, but I'm going through. I'm going to say yes. I'm responding to you. With my knees trembling, I'm going to get up and do what you've asked me to do. And the fourth thing that I'm looking at is Mary's journey. What God asked Mary to do wasn't over in one moment. She just didn't go, yes, and out the next day popped a baby and it was done. And how many of you have been pregnant before in this room? Hands up if you've been pregnant. So a very large part of this room has been pregnant. And let me tell you, they say it's nine months but I think it's like 99 months. There is nothing short about a pregnancy. There is nothing quick about a pregnancy. There is nothing glamorous about a pregnancy. You know, like, oh, it's so romantic to be pregnant. No, it's not. Like, it is not romantic to be pregnant. Maybe making the baby was romantic, 
That is where the end of the romance finished when you became pregnant. And I don't know, maybe you had perfect pregnancies, but anything that you could possibly have in a pregnancy, I had in one of my four pregnancies. As I said, I was pregnant a couple of times, so I've experienced it all. The morning, morning sickness, the, the cankles where your calves and ankles just become one glamorous extension of your body. I did my first pregnancy large and lovely. Honestly, I looked like Puff the Magic Dragon by the time I had Reuben. Honest, every, my nose swelled. Like, how does that happen? If there was a part on my body, it was swollen. And then I would lie there at night and ask my husband to please massage my feet. And I could see him just dying on the inside. Shame. Poor guy. <laughs> but Mary had to go through the process. She had to go through the waiting. She had to go on the journey. She had to conceive this child and walk through that till the delivery. And it didn't end there. She then had to raise the Son of God. Her response was a journey. It was a process. And I wonder, in that pregnancy of Mary's, that nine months, I wonder how she waited. And in verse 39, after Mary had found out she was pregnant, she, it says, Mary didn't waste a minute. You know the story, she runs off and she goes to see Elizabeth. But I love that phrase, she didn't waste a minute. And for some of you, I feel like the Spirit of God is gently wanting to stay. Stop wasting your life. Stop waiting for something to happen. Stop shrinking back. Do not waste a single moment because this life is all that you have. Because when this life is over, it's eternity. We cannot waste a minute when God calls us to do something because we only have this one chance at life. And today I want to ask you six things of how are you waiting right now? We, God is asking you to do something. You are on this process. Yes, it might be difficult. Yes, this journey might feel like it's taking forever, but how are you waiting? Are you sitting around just passively? I'm waiting. Going through the motions of waiting. If it happens, it happens. And you know, so often when we allow ourselves to be in that place of just passively waiting, we can actually become negative in that place. We can actually begin to think, well, what's happening here? I can't see anything. You can't see a baby while you are pregnant. You can't see it. But it doesn't mean that baby is not growing inside of you. It doesn't mean that this child is not developing just because you can't see it. And for some of you, you don't know, God, what are you doing? Where are you? He is there. He is working. But don't wait passively. Let your faith and expectation grow. Don't waste the potential of your victory because of the lack of perseverance and just shrinking back. This is too long, too hard. I can't do it anymore. Maybe you're waiting fearfully because church, there is a faith inside of you tonight that fear is wanting to contain there is a faith inside of you tonight that the enemy is wanting to contain, to shut down, and to squish out. But when we don't allow that fear to overrun us, and you know, I love the story of the disciples in the boat with Jesus. They, they're out at sea. And a huge storm picks up, and the waves and the 
The sea is raging. The wind is blowing. The rain is pouring. It's really a sign of a disaster. But the thing I can never get over when I read that story is the fact that the Son of God was in the boat with them. How can you be fearful if the Son of God is right there with you? Did they not know his power? Did they not know who he was? Did they not know what was inside of him? Did they not know that he had the ability to speak to the storm and say, be quiet? Church, you've got to know who is with you in that storm. Who is with you when you are waiting? And when we understand that, fear is no hold on us. Because the Jesus who got up and said, storm be still, is right here with you. And he can stand and speak to the storm of your life and say, be still. You can go through that storm, even though it might be raging around you. Because he is right there with you in the boat, you will live. You will not be overcome. You will not be drowned. You will not be overrun. Because the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is right with you. Are you in this journey in a place of doubt? And you know, there's a a scripture, and I don't have it up there, where it talks about John the Baptist when he found himself in prison. And he makes a statement, and he says, Can someone go ask Jesus, are you really the one who prophesied would come? Or should we wait for another? And you think, yeah, but surely you know he's the son of God. You were the one who announced him. Behold, the son of God. And here you are saying, are you the one who was prophesied that would come? Or is there someone else coming? And the thing is what happens so often when we find ourselves with our back against the wall, when the pressure's on, we begin to doubt that God is who he says he is. John was in a place where he knew he was going to die. And he began to doubt saying, Jesus, are you the one who who you are? Are you who you say you are? And, you know, we find ourselves in a place of doubting when the pressure hits, when the storm is raging, when things are hard, when the waiting seems like it's taking too long. God, did you really say to me I need to do this? Or did I just make this up? God, are you really who you said you are? And God is always who he says he is. He is always who he says he is. And tonight, girls, no matter how long you are waiting, God is there. And when you recognize he is always who he says he is, doubt cannot creep in and cause us to be double-minded, think it wasn't God. God, where are you? Are you who you say you are? He is always good. He is always who he says he is. And he will always deliver you. Are you in a place of maybe hopelessly waiting? And I know for some of you, disappointment has caused you to lose your hope. And your Jackie spoke so beautifully last night on that. Hope, a confident expectation in God to come through for you. Don't allow your current situation to make you hopeless about what tomorrow will bring. Don't allow your current situation to doubt the future victory that God is going to bring you. Don't allow your current storm, your current situation, your current waiting to not see what tomorrow will bring. And you know, I don't know if Mary went through all of these things. But Mary wasn't some supernatural deity. She was an ordinary, everyday girl just like you and I being asked to do something really, really big, really, really scary. And she needed to be really, really brave. And I think she probably went through all of these emotions. But 
I know that her response was always, be it unto me according to your will. Yes, God, I will always say yes. Yes, I will always do what you are asking me to do. And are you going through this maybe blindly? And when I use the word blindly, I'm asking, can you see and can you imagine with the eye of faith what God is going to do? But so often we see our lives, we, our expectation is filtered through our life experience. So we see the future through our disappointment. We see the future through our loss. We see the future through our fear. We see the future through our reality where God is saying, no, that's not what you see. You don't see with the eye of nat the natural. You see with the eye of faith, which looks beyond this reality to that. Jackie again preached about that last night. This might be our reality right now, but on the other side is Jesus Christ, our victory, our hope, our future. And when we begin to look through the filter of the, what the Word of God says, this does not matter because that is what is real. And tonight, for some of you, you need to begin to open your eyes and see what God is saying. Open your eyes and believe He will do what He said He would do. And you know, we know the story of Abraham where God had promised Abraham so much descendants, so many descendants, how's my English? And he could not see it. He could not see how God could do that. So he kind of made a plan. God is made servant pregnant. You know, I'm going to make my own way. And God's saying, no, that's not what I said. But Abraham couldn't see it. And I love the, the scripture. I think it's Genesis something. I didn't write it down. It says, the Lord took Abraham outside his tent and said to him, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. Abraham had to come out of the tent to see the stars. God needs you to come out of every limitation that could possibly hold you back so that you can see the hope to which he has called you to. And today, by the Spirit of God, I am trusting that every deception, every limitation, every self-limitation, every limitation the world has put on you to say, no, you can't do this. This is your lot. No, it's not your lot. No, this is not where you have to stay. Come out of your tent, see the stars and say, God, that is your promise to me. And God is wanting today for us to come out of a place of being blind I was once blind, but now I see. And by the Spirit of God, we are going to go out of here seeing what it is that God is saying. What are you asking today, God? What is God asking you? And you know what he's asking you. That still small voice, that loud banging gong. You know what God is saying. And God is saying, wait in expectation. Wait in faith. Wait in a place of hope because I'm on my way. What is God asking you today? And my second question today is, what are you facing? What are you facing? But no matter what you are facing, church, today, God is there. And I want to read us and tell us a story today of three men in the Word of God who were young men who faced some adversity and, you know, we might have heard that story of Shadrach, Meshach, and the Bendigo quite a few times. But these three young men who were in Egypt, and King Nebuchadnezzar commanded that every person needed to bow down to a golden calf 
made in his image. And anybody who did not do that would die. And so the officials informed the king that these young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom the king had actually appointed to pretty high positions of office, were refusing to bow to the golden statue. And these three men were brought before him. And I want to read from Daniel 3, from verse 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we were thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you that we will never serve your gods or worship the golden statue that you have set up. Girls, that is faith in the face of adversity. That is saying, no, I will not do what you have told me to do because I know what my God has said. And they brought before him knowing that their response was death. If you will not do this, you will die. And they said, even if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God who we serve is able to save us. An absolute confident belief that the God they served would save them. Girls, tonight, the God who you serve is able to save you. The God you serve is able to deliver you, no matter what fire you are facing. Nebuchadnezzar, his face purple with anger, cut off Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace fired up seven times hotter than usual. He ordered some strong men from the army to tie them up by their hands and feet, throw them into the roaring furnace. So they were bound, hand and foot, fully dressed from head to toe, and they were pitched into the roaring furnace. Because the king was in such a hurry and the furnace was so hot, flames from the furnace killed the men who carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into it. While the fire raged about, around them, Suddenly, King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up and in alarm said, didn't we throw three men into that fire? Yes, that's right, O king, they said. But look, I see four men walking around freely in the fire, completely unharmed. And the fourth man looks like a son of the gods. Girls, tonight, you are not alone in your fire. You are not alone in every circumstance you might find yourself in. In the middle of your fire, He is there with you. No matter what you are facing, no matter your circumstance, He is right there with you. Nebuchadnezzar went to the door of the roaring furnace and called in, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked out of the fire. All the important people, the government, leaders, kings, council, gathered to examine them and discovered that the fire had not so much even touched the three men. Not a hair was singed, not a scorch mark on their clothes, not even the smell of fire on them. And girls, tonight, we will always face some sort of adversity. We will constantly face the mountains. And in your life right now, I don't know what mountain you are facing, but there will always be mountains. But the thing is, we don't have to fear the mountain. We don't have to fear the fire. We don't have to fear the flame because He is right there with you. And I believe we can walk through the fire and come out the other side not even smelling of smoke. We can come out on the other side not smelling of adversity, not smelling like fear, not smelling like the hardship, not smelling like your difficulties, not smelling defeated, but we come out smelling like victory. That is His promise, that we will smell like 